and let them have dominion. A word from Jesus is all you need to read again, to live again. Chains are broken, God is revealed. Praise the leaders to transform the world. Dominion City, raising leaders that transform society. Meanwhile, help me greet somebody around you. Tell him good morning. I hope you enjoy yourself in camp meeting. Please join me and welcome Dr. Cloud King. Good morning, church. You may be seated. Let me share a scripture with you that ought to be an encouragement to us. In the book of Malachi, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 7, in fact, just uh, verse 6, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees, and if not kept them, return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. When we get away from the Lord, we have an open invitation. Come back to me, and I will come back to you. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, um, I stand uh, trembling before your people, thinking of all the things that could be said, but knowing that you know the needs of the people in the room, the people online, you know the needs of the churches. Lord, you know what's going on in Nigeria, and you know not only its present, but you know its future. And you have a plan and a purpose that you want to bring about. So I pray, Lord, that you would um, let me be a vessel. And I pray that your spirit would speak your words to your people this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be sharing with you about Fresh Encounter, God's pattern for revival and spiritual awakening. Revival is what God does with his people. When we get away from him, when we drift and we're not what we need to be, God revives his people. And when we experience revival, then... God's got a people through which he can work to bring about a spiritual awakening. As I shared with you yesterday, a spiritual awakening is where large numbers or high percentages of people come to faith in Christ in such a way that it begins to transform a society, a culture, a community. For instance, in Northampton, Massachusetts, in, uh, I think it was 1736, the pastor, uh, Jonathan Edwards, was preaching a series of messages on justification by faith. And uh, he preached a very famous message, and it was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And it was said that people would stand with uh, their fists clenched to the pew and uh, crying out in fear that they might go to hell when he preached those messages. But in December of that year, six people were converted. And uh, there was rejoicing over that. But one of those people, was, he described her as the uh, chief company keeper in town. I'm not sure, but I think that means prostitute. And uh, in a town of a thousand, everybody knows this lady. And they know her reputation. 
And so um, he knew that with her making a public profession of faith, she really needed to be faithful in responding to the Lord and growing in Christ, or she would bring discredit to the name of Christ. And so he and his church began to minister to her, to disciple her, and her life was radically changed. And when somebody's life is changed that everybody knows they're different, uh, that makes a difference in a community. And over the course of the next six months, over 300 people in town were converted. It was said that there was not a single adult over the age of 18 that was not hopefully converted during that revival. Now, can you imagine living in a village or a town where everybody's a Christian and they act like it? Uh, that happened in Northampton, Massachusetts at the beginning of what became the first great awakening in the United States. That's what we're talking about with awakening. Um, I want to ask you, I'm going to be sharing uh, with you God's pattern for revival and spiritual awakening. And um, you probably are going to hear some things that may sound different than what you may have heard from a pastor or a teacher or uh, somebody on the radio or television. As Pastor David shared with us yesterday, there's some people out there that are preaching that once you come to faith in Christ, you never have to repent again. You never need to confess your sins again. I've heard that argument in the United States, and, and um, that's not biblically correct. But uh, I want to ask you, if you hear some things from me today that um, sound strange and you wonder, is it true or not, I want to ask you to be like the Bereans. In Acts chapter uh, 17, Paul had uh, been in Thessalonica, and uh, the Jews had uh, stoned him in one place. They followed him to Thessalonica. They ran him out of town in Thessalonica, and he went to Berea. In verse 10, of chapter 17, as soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So uh, the Bereans were noble in character because when they listened to the Apostle Paul preach, every day they were going back to the Scriptures to see, now, did, is he speaking truth or is he making this up? And uh, I want to encourage you, if you hear something from me, go to the Scriptures and study the Scriptures and see if it's true from Scripture. So um, let me encourage you to do that. I want to introduce you to seven, real, uh, seven phases in God's pattern for revival and spiritual awakening. If you do have a book, if you'll turn to page 63 in the very back of the book, you'll find there a diagram like the one you see on the screen. And uh, you'll also see a listing or description of the seven phases. I just want to give you an overview of the big picture. We mentioned number one and number seven yesterday, but phase one is where God is on mission to redeem a lost world. And God calls his people into a relationship with himself, and he accomplishes his work through them. Now, that's what God has in mind for us. He's uh, got a mission, a great commission. You've heard of it. We're to go into all the world and make disciples of all peoples. And uh, God wants to do it through us. Jesus is in heaven now. And he's entrusted the future of his work and his kingdom to us to carry out that mission. Uh, phase number two... God's people have a tendency to depart from him, turning to substitutes for his presence, purposes, and ways. 
It may be kind of like a marriage. If you get married, you may have a honeymoon time when you all are just in love with each other and you'd do anything for each other. But then the jobs come and the children come and over the years you may stop and realize, you know, we're not as close as we used to be. We tend to drift and that can happen in our relationship with God. And when God's people depart from him, phase three, God disciplines his people out of his love for them. He loves us. I think there are two reasons God disciplines us. One is God knows that up there in the top of that arrow, on mission with him, that's where we experience the abundant life Jesus came to give us. And uh, if we're not there, we're... It's kind of like we're down in the gutter and God says, don't stay down there living a mediocre life. Come on back up here where you belong so you can experience the power and presence of my working in and through you. Uh, A second reason God disciplines us, though, is that um, he has work for us to do. Uh, He's in heaven He's given us an assignment. If we don't obey his commands, people die and go to hell. And God so loved the world, he sent his son to die for them. And he's not content that people die without the benefit of his son's saving grace. And uh, he wants us to do our work. And so when we have departed from him and we're not doing our work, he disciplines us and calls us to get back to work. He has an assignment for us. It's not just a a harsh master, though. He's a loving father, and he knows that when he is filling us and we're on mission with him and he's working through us, that's how we can experience the abundant life that God intended for us. So um, God disciplines his children, and he does it because he loves us, and he loves a lost world. But when God disciplines us, his discipline becomes more and more in, uh, intense until he finally gets our attention. Maybe you've experienced this as a parent where you'll uh, correct your child and say, don't do that again, and they do it again. And the next time, you may get a little louder. And the next time, you may have some severe consequences, maybe physical consequences, to say to your child, do not do that again. And you intensify the discipline until you accomplish the purpose to correct the child. God's discipline intensifies like that until phase four, God's people cry out to him for help. Now, when God's people cry out to him for help, God calls his people to repent and return to him or perish. Now, when I use the word perish there and you see on the diagram, it says judgment I'm not talking about eternal destiny, but I am talking about usefulness for the kingdom. And uh, if we do not repent, we are of little or no use to God and his kingdom purposes. And there are consequences if we continue to rebel against the will of the Lord. Uh, But God's not interested in the parish side of that equation. He's interested in return to me. Repent. And when God's people repent, we get to, um, to phase six. God revives his repentant people by restoring them to a right relationship with himself. Uh, that's where revival takes place. God revives his people, and then he's got a people through which he can work. When God revives his people, then we get, he's got people rightly related to him. He's able to fill them with his spirit. He's able to work through them for his divine purposes. And that's when he's able to accomplish his redemptive work of bringing people to saving faith in his son. And when it happens in large numbers or high percentages, we call it a spiritual awakening. Let me share with you about a church in Wellington, Texas. The story is on page, um, I think it's, well, I thought I wrote it down, about page 10. 
or 12. But um, this is about a church that um, had got a call from the pastor. And uh, let's forget about where the page is. Let me tell you this story. I got a call from this pastor and he said, uh, uh, Claude T.W. Hunt gave me your phone number and I wanted to call and ask you to pray for my church and if God tells you anything, call me back. Well, I'd never had a request like that. And so I said, well, tell me about your church. And he said, well, uh, my church is in a farming community in West Texas. He said, uh, up in the panhandle, he said, um, we have about 3,500 people in our whole county. That's fewer people than are in the auditorium today. And uh, he said, uh, our church runs about 250. And uh, he said, uh, we went through a study of your book, Experiencing God, Knowing and Doing the Will of God. And, and as people in our church went through that, uh, they began to develop an intimate love relationship with their Heavenly Father, and they began to get a, a burden for being on mission with God. And, and we saw some real responsiveness during that time, and we sensed God was working to revive us. And he said, we went through a study of fresh encounter, God's pattern for revival and spiritual awakening, and he said, uh, we begin repenting of sin and getting rid of uh, substitutes for God and, and getting rid of idols of the heart. And he said, um, I think we've been revived. He said, there's uh, something different about our church. He said, uh, people love each other. He said, I get calls every week. Uh, Pastor, is there anybody that has needs that I can help meet their needs? And he said, um, there's a spirit of unity that even in our business meetings, uh, we have a spirit of unity and harmony and people are not at odds with each other anymore. And he said, even the deacons love the pastor. He said, I've never been in a church like this before. And uh, he said, I think we've experienced revival, but as we've been praying about it, we really have a burden for two things. Number one, when we look at this pattern for revival and spiritual awakening, we're not seeing a harvest. And, uh, and we just believe that if we have been revived, God said, if you return to me, I'll return to you. We're not seeing his manifest presence in saving work in the people we're around. And so we're praying for a harvest. And he said the second thing, God's given us a burden that we're not the people of prayer we need to be. And he said, would you pray for us? And if God tells you anything, call me back. Well, I had some time that day and... I just went down into the park in my neighborhood and started walking around the track and praying, talking to the Lord, and I started getting all these ideas of what I might share with him, and I came back to my office, I wrote down two pages of notes, and I called Johnny Timms back up, and I said, let me just share with you some ideas about what I think you all might do to focus on prayer and harvest, and uh, here's what they did, they decided we want to remove everything from our church calendar that will distract people from a focus on prayer and harvest during this season of the year. It was actually the springtime of the year. They went through a six-week study I had written with T.W. Hunt on prayer. And so five days a week, people were doing homework, learning how to pray and practicing on their own. And then one day a week on Sunday morning, they were going to go through, have a prayer meeting in all of their ch Sunday school classes throughout the church. They started with sixth graders all the way through adults that studied this book. And they began to learn how to pray. They began to um, have, uh, take up prayer requests in the worship service and had people in a prayer room during the worship service praying for the spiritual needs of the requests of the people that were in the worship service at that time, believing that if people give a request, that's at least a mustard seed of faith that God would do something in their lives and they want to pray that God will answer those prayers. So they started doing that. Then uh, because they're praying for harvest, one of the ideas we came up with is beginning the day after Passover, the Jewish people begin counting up to 50 so that they uh, can celebrate Pentecost. And uh, you know what happened on Pentecost, don't you? 
The church was born, 3,000 people got saved, and so they're praying for a harvest. And so we gave them a little calendar with a scripture to read each day, and we asked every family, get together, read the scripture, talk about what God's saying through that scripture, start making a list of all the lost people in your circles of relationships, and begin to pray for them for 50 days. We're praying for a harvest. We'll put names and faces on those people. So that's what they begin doing. For 50 days, they pray. Got an idea from South Africa. Henry, uh, uh, Andrew Murray told the story in South Africa about how uh, one of their pastors during the time when they needed revival, he said, you know, the early church, they prayed for 10 days and uh, after they'd prayed for 10 days, the Holy Spirit fell on them and he said, I wonder if that would help us. So he led his church into having 10 days of corporate prayer meetings every night for 10 nights. They were meeting together and praying and uh, they noticed that after those 10 days of prayer, they began to see people come to faith in Christ. So the next year, they scheduled it that way, 10 days of prayer and evangelistic meetings following the 10 days of prayer. They called it Pentecost prayer meetings. Well, this church decided to do that. So one night they had a missions team that was going to Russia and they uh, laid hands on them, prayed for them, commissioned them, and sent them off. Another night, they invited all of the different churches, different denominations in the county to come together to pray. One night, they got all the Baptists together to pray. Another night, they had uh, cottage prayer meetings and they met in homes all over the community and prayed. One night, they went prayer walking and prayer driving all around the county to pray for their community. And, and then they invited me to come Pentecost weekend to be with them and I met a church that had learned to pray. Well, even the lady who taught the sixth grade boy, she said, uh, Claude, um, the week we were studying about praise, I had three boys in my class that Sunday morning, and I got them started praying, and they prayed for 30 minutes, praising the Lord. She said, I've never heard little boys pray like that before. And um, she was really encouraged. I met with a young adult group, and they would surface a request and just pray all around that request. And... Somebody else would surface a request and we'd pray all around that. And we did that for two hours. And finally the leader said, hey, we gotta go to church in the morning, we better quit. And uh, I saw a church that had learned to pray. Next morning at the worship service, they started sharing testimonies of what God had been doing in their lives. And uh, they got carried away. And their uh, services were on cable television which meant that there was a hard stop time. I mean, it's, you got a clock and you got to quit on time. And um, when they gave the service over to me, I didn't have time to preach. So I read a scripture, shared a few words, we gave an invitation, and uh, one little boy came walking down the aisle and made a profession of faith. He had gotten saved earlier in the week, and it was like popping a balloon. They were so pumped up and thinking, God's going to do a miraculous thing. We've been praying for months. We've been praying by name for hundreds of people, and we're just believing God's going to send a great harvest, and it didn't happen. And they were so discouraged. But it's Pentecost Sunday, and Pentecost is a feast day. So we went and had dinner on the grounds, had ate lunch together. And while we were eating, a lady who had watched the TV program that morning in her home came to the church and found the pastor, and she said, I want what those people were talking about. And he led her to the Lord, and that was the first fruits. Well, I went home. About three months later, I gave Pastor Tim's a call, and I said, I just wanted to check up on you and see how things are going. He said, well, Claude, my people are saying, Pastor, we can't go back to the old way of doing things. He said, uh, that missions team we commissioned to go to Russia, they personally led 400 people to the Lord. And he said, um, during, the, during the last few, three months, he said, we've been involved in prison ministry for years, but in the last three months, 225 prisoners have given their lives to the Lord. 
And then he said, in our little town, 25 of the people that we have been praying for in our town, family members, neighbors, co-workers, they've been saved. And he said, we can't go back to the old way of doing things. Now, I was telling that story years later in Colorado, and a pastor interrupted me, and he said, you don't know the rest of the story, do you? And I said, well, maybe not. What's the rest of the story? He said, they weren't the only missions team on that trip to Russia. We had a bunch of churches that were on that same missions trip, and we'd been working together when we heard about the praying that was going on in Wellington, Texas for our mission trip, we believed that God was answering the prayers of the people in Wellington. It wasn't 400, it was 10,000. It was just the Wellington people had led 400 to the Lord. When God's got a people rightly related to him, a spiritual harvest is a natural byproduct of that. Uh, but we've got a problem. And our problem is that God's people tend to depart from him in phase two. Um, God's people tend to depart. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse um, 17, we see the symptoms of departure. Um, verse 17, in this chapter, the beginning of the verse, God says, if you obey me, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to prosper you. But verse 17 is a turning point and it says, but if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, then here's what I'm going to do to you. Notice the sequence of the departure. If your heart departs. The beginning of our departure from the Lord begins with a shift of our heart where we don't love God quite as much as we used to love God. And when our heart shifts and we don't love God as much as we're supposed to love God, by the way, how much are we supposed to love him? with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, if we don't love him like we're supposed to love him, it's going to start showing up in our behavior. And one of the symptoms of a departed heart is that we no longer obey the commands of the Lord. If you've got an obedience problem and you're not obeying the clear commands of the Lord, that's an indicator that your heart has shifted. If you were to go to the doctor because you've got a fever, the doctor's going to check your symptoms before he tries to diagnose what the problem is. Well, there may be a problem. I had a fever and a, a tender side one time, my pain in my lower stomach, and went to the doctor and I had appendicitis. And, and uh, they had to perform surgery to solve that problem. And... Um, when you look at the symptoms of a lack of obedience, what that tells you is there's a, a heart problem and you don't love God the way you're supposed to love the Lord. There's another substitute for God or another symptom and that is when we begin to worship other gods and bow down to them. Now, many of you may think, you know, well, I, I worship the Lord God. I don't have a, an, any idols in my house. But... You may have an idol of the heart. In Ezekiel, the scripture says, God says to Ezekiel, he takes him into the, leader, into the temple, gives him a vision of the leadership, and he says, these men have set up idols in their heart. An idol of the heart is where you begin to love something or someone or some activity so much that it distracts you from your love for the Lord. And so Jesus gave us a list of some of those. You can love money and, and instead of God. You can't love God and money at the same time. We're told that you can't love the world and the things of the world and the love of the Father be in you at the same time. We're told that you can't love what you have 
and what you do and love God at the same time. You can't love father and mother, son or daughter more than him and love him at the same time the way he wants to be loved. And so uh, those can become idols of the heart. And uh, if our heart departs, uh, we're going to show it in the way we behave. As spiritual leaders, we need to understand that the, the departure, the symptoms of departure are an indicator that there's a heart problem. Uh, I want to introduce you to a, a topic in Amos chapter 7. In Amos chapter 7, God sets a plumb line alongside his people, and you may notice in the center of that circle as you're looking at the diagram, there's a plumb line there. Uh, Amos chapter 7, God says, um, uh, Amos, what do you see? This is what the Lord showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, I am setting a plumb line alongside my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. If you go back and read earlier in Amos, three different times God said, I'm going to bring, to, said to Amos, I'm going to bring judgment on the nation. Amos stood in the gap in behalf of the nation and pled with God not to bring judgment and three times God relented the scripture says and he didn't bring judgment but this time God says Amos I'm going to set a plumb line alongside my people Israel I'll spare them no longer and this time no amount of praying and appeal from Amos was going to change his mind when God sets a plumb line, it's a serious time for a people. Now, I brought a, an example of a plumb bob. You probably can't see this from where you are, but uh, a plumb line is a weight that hangs on the end of a string. And a carpenter would use this weight to make sure that a wall is straight up and down and uh, because it hangs straight. Now, this plumb line really represents God's standard. And God says, I've got a standard for my people, and I'm going to put my plumb line alongside my people. Today, God's word is our plumb line, and we need to examine God's word and measure our lives and our practices based on what God's got to say in his word. Well, there's an illustration in uh, physical illustration called the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I think I've got an illustration of it in, in my PowerPoint, but the Leaning Tower of Pisa is in Pisa, Italy. It's a tower that's 179 feet tall. It's a bell tower. It was made out of uh, solid marble. The walls at the bottom of the tower are 13 feet thick. The walls at the top of the tower are six feet thick. So this is a heavy tower. And the problem is that it was built in the 1300s. The problem is the tower is leaning. Now, if I were to put a plumb line alongside that tower, you would see that it is over 17 feet off of where it's supposed to be. And... Um, if I were to just ask you, you'll notice the letters up there. What's the, where's the problem with the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Is it at A, because the walls are crooked, or is the problem at the foundation at B? Where's the problem? What's the foundation? Don't You know that. Uh, suppose I had a huge crane, and I could attach it to the top of that tower and pull it back into place. And I didn't do anything else and then I let go of the, the, bring the pressure off, what do you suppose would happen to that tower? Well, it's gonna go right back where it was, might even keep right on going. 
Uh, if I don't solve the problem at the foundation, everything else I do to that tower is going to be a temporary fix. Now, this is a visual illustration of Amos chapter 7. I'm not sure, but what God let the, created the Leaning Tower of Pisa just as a visual for us to, to learn from. But here's the deal. If, if we have a, departed from the Lord as, a, as an individual or as a church, if our church has departed from the Lord and we're comparing ourselves to other people who've departed from the Lord, we'll think, well, I'm not quite as good as him. I'm way better than them. I'm doing fine. And God's people thought they were doing just fine until God showed them the plumb line so they could see how far they were away from the Lord. Now, when God set the plumb line in Amos, he's getting ready to bring destruction on the nation. And he set the plumb line just to let them know, everything I'm about to do to you, you deserved it all. So when God sets a plumb line, it's a scary thing. But um, God's plumb line reveals to us how far we've departed. And uh, at spiritually, we need to think about what, how do you solve the problem if your heart has departed? Now, as you look at that illustration again, you'll notice that um, if I were to try to solve the symptoms, I would make a temporary dent in the problem, but I wouldn't solve the problem long term. And so I need to deal with the foundation. Let me put some names, some spiritual titles on those two letters. Up at A, according to Deuteronomy chapter 30, and we don't need to go back to that, but at A, one of the symptoms is a lack of obedience. And so if you're not obeying the clear commands of the Lord, that's one of the symptoms. Another of the symptoms is idols of the heart or turning to substitutes for God and his purposes and his ways. And uh, we can either try to straighten out the symptoms or we can work on the foundation. So what's at the foundation? That's the love relationship. Remember, if the love relationship, if our heart departs, then these other things can creep into our lives. But if we'll fix our love relationship, Jesus said something about that. You remember in John 14, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what? You'll keep my commandments. You see how those go together? Get the love relationship right, people will obey. Um, now here's the, here's the thing for a pastor. Those of you who are, are leaders or maybe even in, with your family, if you're having trouble with people obeying the clear commands of the Lord, it would be possible for you to take this approach. Man, things are so bad, there's so many issues, I'm going to just have to focus on one of them. And so as a pastor, you prepare a message to speak about this particular sin issue. And I'm not telling you don't preach about sin, but you preach about that issue and uh, you pray and you prepare your message, you preach, and uh, people start responding, so you're encouraged. You work on sin area number two, and you preach and pray and, and uh, plead and counsel and, and uh, pray with people and encourage them, and they start responding, and you're encouraged, and you, you start working on area number three, and man, this one's a tough one, and you're having trouble getting people to respond, and you're praying, and you're preaching, you preach several messages, and People just aren't getting it. And you might throw a little guilt in there or try to manipulate, bring pressure to bear. Straighten up and do right. Quit living like that. And, you, and you, they start responding. You're encouraged and you work on area number four. And then you think, now let me take a check and see how things are going. Oh, no. They went back to the old way of doing things. If you don't solve the love relationship problem, Everything you do to try to fix the symptoms will be a temporary fix. And so, as an individual, as a church, 
when we see the symptoms of a problem, we need to go back and work on the love relationship. The good thing is, God's got solutions for that. You remember the church at Ephesus? He said, uh, you do a lot of good things, but I have one thing against you. Do you remember what that was? They had left their first love. Well, what did he tell them to do? He said, uh, I want you to remember the height from which you've fallen. In other words, you used to be what I created you to be. You've fallen away from that. You've departed from that. And I want you to remember what it used to be like. I've done this with churches to review our spiritual markers and the things God has done in our past. And uh, oftentimes, when I've done that with churches that are in trouble, when they see and remember what God has done in their past, they think, we want that back. We used to enjoy coming to church. We used to see God manifest presence in our church, and it's not that way anymore. We want that back. That's one of the things a church can do. He said, start doing the things you did at first. And uh, that's another thing we can do. It may be that as a, as a young Christian, you remember just being in love with the Lord and you were witnessing to everybody and you were reading the scripture and memorizing scripture and, and uh, you were faithful and active in church and things aren't like they used to be. Start doing the things that you used to do, that God blessed and you knew his presence and power at work in you. But then there's a, another thing we need to do and that's repent. Turn to him. That's what Jesus said to the church at Ephesus. And then the, another thing I've thought about, and this weekend is a significant weekend, I believe, for all of us. Uh, if we want to look work on the love relationship, the scripture tells us that God loved us, or it says that we love him, Why? Because he first loved us, and God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, what did he do? Christ died for us. I believe that the Lord's Supper, I believe that Easter weekend is a ideal opportunity for us to return to our first love. I don't know how you responded to it, but last night when we watched that clip from the Passion of the Christ, it is so easy for us to come to the Lord's table and take the bread and drink the juice and, and go through the ritual, and it doesn't do anything to our hearts. But when we focus our attention on what Jesus Pay, the price Jesus paid on the cross because of my sin. Those lashes were because of my sin. Those nails were because of my sin. His broken body, his shed blood, he did that because he loved me. That ought to prompt me to love him. And this weekend, as we focus on the cross, this is going to be a wonderful opportunity for, for all of us to return, to rekindle a first love for our Savior and love him the way we need to love him. So if we're going to solve the problem, we're going to need to deal with the love relationship. Um, when God's people have departed from him, God disciplines his people, phase three. And this is probably the area that's maybe going to challenge you the most, but God does discipline his people. Let me read to you a passage from Hebrews chapter 12. You're familiar with this, I think. But um, verse four. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten that word of encouragement. Notice this is a word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, 
and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes every one he accepts as a son. You do know, don't you, that this is true? This is God's word. This is a New Testament passage. This isn't Old Testament. God says to us, I love you. As sons and daughters, I love you. And when you get away from what I intend for you and you're not experiencing the abundant life I intended for you, you're not experiencing my best, I will discipline you because I love you. I won't let you stay where you are. It would not be God's love if he did not correct us and discipline us. God does discipline his children. Uh, there, there are two kinds of uh, um, disciplines that we see in the scripture or judgments. One of those is an eternal judgment. We're not talking about that kind. But the other kind is temporal judgment. Judgment that uh, relates to the here and now, and there are two types of that eternal, uh, temporal judgment. One of them is a remedial judgment where God wants to correct us. And then we do see in the New Testament scripture and lots of it in the Old Testament, there are times where God will execute a final judgment. Now, final judgment is where life ends, or there's no longer a chance to respond. An example of that would be Ananias and Sapphira. You're familiar with their story. Their sin and lying to the Holy Spirit at the early days of the first church, God knew that that sin left undealt with would corrupt the church and everything that started from it. And he dealt severely with the sin of Ananias and Sapphira, and it cost them their life. There was no option to correct their error. They died. Now, we have another occasion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and he said, you have uh, partaken of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, and you have not given proper regard to the body and blood of Christ. And consequently, some of you are weak, some of you are sick. He's talking to a church. Some are weak, some are sick, some sleep. But he's not talking about a nap. Some of you have died because you have offended me in the way you've partaken of the Lord's Supper. And uh, that's a final judgment, the dying part. But uh, God's really interested in the remedial part, and that's typically the way God deals with his people. Uh, in the study of Fresh Encounter, in fact, part of the reason that we've been, Pastor David has uh, secured these books and provided them for you is to uh, help the people study this message and uh, begin to learn how to identify if we're not what God wants us to be, how do we get back to where God wants us to be so that we can experience the mighty power and presence of God working in us and through us and we can be his instruments to a lost world. And uh, one of the things we deal with here is the disciplines of the Lord and uh, the ways God maybe disciplines his people. If you've got a copy of the book, you could turn to page 40. And uh, I think as, a, as Nigerians, you all need to pay attention to some of the ways biblically that God disciplines people and a nation. And when these things start happening, it ought to cause God's people to go to the Lord and say, Lord, is this a discipline because of sin? Now, some of these things are, are natural disasters, and the, the earth, because of the fall of Adam, the earth is groaning, and uh, the creation is groaning, and it's not going to be all fixed until a new heaven and a new earth come.
but uh, listen to some of the ways in Scripture God brought judgment on people. Through natural disasters like earthquake, volcano, hurricane, tornado, flood, fire, drought, hail, famine, insect plague, and attack of wild animals. He brought uh, judgment by disease, plague, wasting disease, fever, and leprosy, by human conflict or trouble, war, attack or defeat by an enemy, being taken into captivity or bondage, being ruled by those who hate you, being a victim of crime, a victim of immorality, bloodshed, increase in wickedness, broken human relationships, economic collapse. Now when those things happen to you, it may or may not be God's discipline. But when things like that do happen, it's an invitation for you to go talk to the Lord about it. If God's wanting to correct your behavior, he's going to let you know what wants, he wants to change. And some of those things like being the victim of a crime. Being a victim of a crime, somebody else sinned against you. And you just may be a victim. Now God is uh, powerful and the scripture tells us he can take all things and work them together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God doesn't cause all those things to discipline us. But uh, sometimes there are things like that that are, are not God's discipline. Uh, but we can talk to him about it, and if God wants to correct something, he can. Now look on the next page, and you'll see some other things God may use to discipline us. Number one, God may uh, refuse to hear your prayers. Have you ever prayed for something and felt like you're just, your prayers aren't getting any higher than the ceiling? Well, the scripture says that your iniquities have separated you from your God, your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. The psalmist said, if I regard or hold on to iniquity in my heart, God won't hear me. So if God's not answering your prayers, it may be an indicator there's sin in your life. Um, number two, God may withdraw the awareness of his presence. In Psalm 13, 1, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? When God hides his face from us, he shuts down communication. The face represents God's acceptance of us, and he sees with his eyes, he hears with his ears, he speaks to us. And when God hides his face because of our sin, we're not hearing the word of the Lord. We're, he, we sense he's not paying attention to what's going on in our life. And uh, he's not hearing our cries. That could be a discipline from the Lord. Number three, God may send a famine of hearing a word from the Lord. In Amos, God says, I'm going to send a famine not of, work, not of food or water, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. People will go from coast to coast looking for a word from the Lord and they won't hear from me. Number four, God may remove the hedge of protection from us and from those we love. In Isaiah 5, 5, it descri God describes the fact he'd done everything he could for his vineyard and it did not produce good fruit and so he breaks down the hedge of protection and allows the enemy to overrun the vineyard. That same imagery is in the book of Job. Number five, God may allow us to reap the full consequences of our sinful behavior. And he describes that in Romans 1. And finally, God may destroy or remove. The church at Ephesus that we've talked about already, what was it their problem was? They left their first love. Well, how serious is that? Come on. Well, if love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is the first and the greatest command, the church at Ephesus was violating the big one. And Jesus said to them, remember the height from which you fall and do, the work, do your first works. Repent. If you do not repent, I will remove your candlestick. Now, candlesticks don't sound too serious unless you've read chapter 1. 
Because in chapter 1 it says the candlestick represents the church. Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, and keep in mind this is New Testament, this is not Old Testament. Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, if you don't repent and return to your first love, I'll remove your church. I don't know what it's like here in Nigeria. My denomination, Southern Baptist, in the United States, we have 800 to 1,000 churches die every year. 800 to 1,000 churches die every year. We have to start 1,000 churches just to break even. Now, some of those churches just didn't get started right. But some of them, I believe, are experiencing the discipline of God when he said, you left your first love, and if you don't repent on that one, I'm going to remove your candlestick. That points out how serious it is for us to repent and return to the Lord. Um... Let me just give you a real quick summary of a revival that happened in the Shantung Revival. It's in the books that you have. But in China, in the Shandong province, the uh, missionaries who were there were concerned about the uh, condition of the Chinese Christians. And they began to wonder, have the Chinese people given a mental assent to faith in Christ but they've never really been genuinely converted. You remember the scripture tells us that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He's different. And they weren't seeing the difference in the Chinese people, many of them. And so they began to pray. God uh, took them through a series where the leaders began to, to confess their sins and get right with each other. And they experienced a revival among the missionaries. But then God began to use a lady named Marie Munson. She asked several questions. She asked people, have you been born of the Spirit? People who had made a profession of faith would say yes. Then she would ask, what's the evidence that you've been born of the Spirit? Well, that's a different question, isn't it? And people began to realize, there's no evidence. My life's not any different than anybody else's life out there. We had a missionary, Southern Baptist missionary there, who was a nurse. And she uh, had been serving in, as a missionary for nine years, and God convicted her that when she was a child, all the other girls walked forward and made professions of faith. She thought that was the right thing to do. She walked forward, but she realizes she never accepted Christ. She never trusted him as her savior. She never repented of her sin, and she went to college, and and heard about nursing and how that could be a wonderful uh, way to serve the Lord. And she decided that sounded good. And she'd been serving nine years and she got saved. A man named Mr. Cho uh, was an evangelist for 25 years. Preaching the gospel all over China. And God convicted him that his was just a head knowledge. And he repented and got saved. And he, from that point on, he quit accepting any payment for preaching the gospel. He said, I've been preaching the gospel with no spirit and no power for 25 years. And I've been overpaid. And so he got saved and began to preach for free. Revival began to take place. And in one school, 600 girls got saved in 10 days. 900 out of 1,000 boy students got saved. So that's what God can do when he's revived the people. Tomorrow, I kind of end on a bad note. God disciplines us and we cry out to him as the, the next phase. But the good news is God's got solutions for us. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. Pray with me. Lord, um, we're your servants. I pray that you'll give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Lord, would you reveal to us any way we've departed from you and bring us back to a wholehearted love for you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
This is the end of this part. Please play the next tape in the series.